Hello, this is video lecture number 101. Uh, today we are talking about the dawning of the conservative age. Our subsections are the Reagan Coalition, Conservatives in Power, and finally Mourning in America. Ronald Reagan soundly defeated Jimmy Carter, 489 electoral votes to 49. Of the states, only Georgia, Carter's home, Minnesota, uh, his running mate Walter Mondale's home, and West Virginia stayed in the Democratic column. The rest of the nation went to the Republicans. Reagan had a clear mandate for change and, once in office, immediately began to implement a conservative program, which focused on reducing taxes, reducing spending, reducing regulations, and reducing inflation, uh, the latter through the Federal Reserve's tight money policies. So let's look at this dawning of the conservative age, then with our first subsection, the Reagan Coalition. The core of the Republican Party uh, remained relatively affluent, white, Protestant voters who supported balanced budgets, uh, opposed government activism, feared crime and communism, and believed in a strong national defense. But Reagan Republicanism also attracted middle-class suburbanites, and migrants to the Sun Belt states who endorsed the conservative agenda of combating crime and limiting social welfare spending. This emerging Republican coalition was joined by a large and electorally key group of former Democrats, uh, Southern whites that had been gradually moving toward the Republican Party since 1984. Reagan capitalized on the Southern strategy developed by Richard Nixon. Now, many Southern whites had lost confidence in the Democratic Party, but one factor stood out, the party's support for civil rights. After 1980, Southern whites would remain a cornerstone of the Republican coalition. Now, the religious right proved crucial to the Republican victory as well. It called for a constitutional ban on abortion, voluntary prayer in public schools, um, and a mandatory death penalty for certain crimes. Reagan's broad coalition attracted the allegiance of blue-collar Catholics, alarmed by anti-war protesters and rising welfare expenditures, uh, and hostile to feminist demands. Some observers saw these voters, which many called uh, Reagan Democrats, as coming from the silent majority that Nixon had swung into the Republican fold in 1968 and 72. They lived in heavy, uh, heavily industrialized Midwestern states, such as Michigan, Ohio, and Illinois, and had been a core part of the Democratic coalition for three decades. Reagan's victory in the 1980s hinged on both a revival of right-wing conservative activism and broad dissatisfaction with liberal Democrats. Let's go to the next section now with conservatives in power. In his first years in office, Reagan asked his chief and his chief advisor, James Baker III, uh, set out to roll back federal taxes, social welfare spending, and the regulatory bureaucracy. They advocated a vast increase in defense spending and an end to detente with the Soviet Union. To match the resurgent economies of Germany and Japan, they set out to restore American leadership of the world's capitalist societies and to inspire renewed faith in free markets. To achieve its economic objectives, the new administration advanced a set of policies dubbed Reaganomics uh, to increase the production and thus the supply of goods. The theory underlying this supply-side economics, as the approach was called, emphasized investment in productive enterprises. According to supply-side theorists, the best way to bolster uh, investment was to reduce the taxes paid by corporations and wealthy Americans, uh, who could then use these funds to expand production. Supply-siders maintained that the resulting economic expansion would increase government revenues and offset the loss of tax dollars stemming from the original tax cuts. Meanwhile, the increasing supply would generate its own demand as consumers stepped forward to buy ever more goods. Supply-side theory presumed, in fact, they gambled that future tax revenues 
would make up for present tax cuts. Reagan took advantage of Republican control of the Senate to win congressional approval then of the 1981 Economic Recovery Tax Act, a massive tax cut that embodied supply-side principles. The act reduced income tax rates uh, for most Americans by 23% over three years. For the wealthiest Americans, the highest marginal tax rate dropped from 70% to 50%. Now, David Stockman, Reagan's budget director, hoped to match a reduction in tax revenue with a cutback in federal expenditures uh, and proposed substantial cuts in Social Security and in Medicare. But Congress, and even the President himself, rejected this idea. Uh, they were not willing to antagonize middle class and elderly voters who viewed these government entitlements as sacred. Social uh, Security and Medicare, next to defense spending, were by far the nation's largest budget items. Uh, reductions in other programs would not achieve the savings that the administration desired. This contradiction then uh, between new right Republican ideology and political reality would continue to frustrate the party into the 21st century. Now, as spending cuts fell short, the federal budget deficit increased dramatically. Military spending contributed a large share of the growing federal debt. Reagan and Defense Secretary Casper Weinberger pu uh, pushed through Congress a five-year, $1.2 trillion military spending program. By the time Reagan left office, the total federal debt had tripled rising from $930 billion in 1981 to $2.8 trillion in 89. The rising annual deficits of the 80s contradicted Reagan's pledge of fiscal conservatism. Now, deregulation of prices in trucking, airline, and railroad industries had begun under Carter in the late 70s, but Reagan expanded the mandate to include cutting back on government protections of consumers, workers, and the environment. To reduce the reach of federal regulatory agencies, the Reagan administration cut their own budgets uh, by an average of 12%. During his two terms, Reagan appointed uh, 368 federal court judges, most of them with conservative credentials, and three Supreme Court justices, Antonin Scalia, Sandra Day O'Connor, and Anthony Kennedy. Ironically, uh, the latter two turned out to be far less devoted to New Right conservatism than Reagan and his supporters imagined. Reagan also elevated Justice William Rehnquist, a conservative Nixon appointee, to the position of Chief Justice. Under Rehnquist's leadership from 1986 to 2005, the court's conservatives took an activist stance, uh, limiting the reach of federal laws, ending court-ordered busing, uh, and endorsing constitutional protection of pro property rights. On controversial issues such as individual liberties, abortion rights, affirmative action, and the rights of criminal defendants, the presence of O'Connor enabled the court to resist the rightward drift and to maintain a moderate position. As a result, the justices scaled back but did not usually overturn the liberal rulings of the Warren and Burger courts. Another conservative legacy was the slow national response to one of the worst disease epidemics of the post-war decades, HIV and AIDS. In 1981, American physicians identified HIV as a new virus, one that was causing the deaths of hundreds of gay men who were prominent among the earliest carriers of the disease. Within the United States, AIDS took nearly 100,000 lives in the 1980s, more than were lost in the Korean and Vietnam Wars combined. However, because its most prominent early victims were gay men, President Reagan, emboldened by new right conservatives, hesitated in declaring a national health emergency. In Reagan's last years in office then, the administration finally began to devote federal resources to treatment for HIV and AIDS patients and research into possible vaccines. And that research continues today. All right, our last section is mourning in America. Reagan's tax cuts had barely taken effect when he was forced to reverse course. 
High interest rates set by the Federal Reserve Board had cut the runaway inflation of the Carter years, but sent the economy into a recession um, in 1981 and 82 that put 10 million Americans out of work and shuttered 17,000 businesses. Empl unemployment reached 10 percent, uh, the highest rate since the Great Depression. Reagan was forced to negotiate then a tax increase with Congress in 1982. Uh, to the loud complaints of the supply-side diehards. The president's job rating plummeted, and in, and in the 1982 midterms, Democrats picked up 26 seats in the House of Representatives and seven state governorships. Now, fortunately for Reagan, the economy had recovered by 1983, restoring the president's job approval rating just in time for the 1984 presidential election. During that campaign, Reagan emphasized the economic resurgence, uh, touring the country, promoting his tax policies, and the nation's new prosperity. The Democrats nominated former Vice President Walter Mondale of Minnesota. Reagan won a landslide victory, losing only Minnesota and the District of Columbia. Still, Democrats retained their majority in the House and, in 1986, regained control of the Senate. By 1985, for the first time since 1915, the United States registered a negative balance of international payments. It now imported more goods and capital than it exported. The country became a debtor rather than a creditor nation. The rapid ascent of the Japanese economy uh, to become the world's second largest was a key factor in this historic reversal. Meanwhile, American businesses grappled with a worrisome decline in productivity. Because managers wanted to cut costs, the wages of most employees stagnated. Further, because of foreign competition, the number of high-paying, union-protected manufacturing jobs shrank. Increasingly, financial services, medical services, computer technology, uh, service industries, broadly speaking, were the leading sectors of growth. This shift in the underlying foundation of the American economy from manufacturing to service, um, which is from making things to producing services, uh, would have long-term consequences for uh, the global competitiveness of U.S. industries and also the value of the dollar. The economic growth of the second half of the 1980s then popularized the materialistic values championed by the free marketeers. In the 1980s, Americans celebrated wealth accumulation in ways unseen since the 1920s. Now, scientists had devised the first computers for military purposes during World War II. Cold War military research subsequently funded the construction of large mainframe computers, uh, but they were too bulky for personal use. Between the 1950s and the 1970s, concluding with the development of the microprocessor in 1971, each uh, generation of computers grew faster and smaller. Apple Computers, founded in 1976, uh, began producing small, individual computers that could easily be used by a single person. When Apple enjoyed success, other companies scrambled to get into the market. International Business Machines, or IBM, offered its first personal computer in 1981. But Apple Corporation's 1984 Macintosh computer, later shortened to the Mac, became the first runaway commercial success for a personal computer. Then in 1975, Bill Gates and Paul Allen founded the Microsoft Corporation, uh, whose MS-DOS and Windows operating systems soon dominated the software industry. In three decades, the computer had moved from a few military research centers to thousands of corporate offices and then to millions of people's homes. In an age that celebrated free market capitalism, government research and government funding had played an enormous role in the development of the most important technology since the television. Okay, this does conclude then our video lecture for today. Go ahead and answer those review questions and continue on with your work.